Good day, viewers. Welcome back to the Free Marketeers podcast. I have a very special episode for all of you today, so thank you very much for joining us. Uh, first of all, we are joined by Davi Ruet, the Chief Economist at the Efficient Group. Davi, thank you very much for being with us. An absolute pleasure, and thank you very much for asking me, and always very, very nice to see my good friend, Leon, as well. Well, there we go. We've got the lead-in for our second guest. We've got Leon. Hi, hi, it's an honor always to be with Ravi, but I have to say it's worse than an honor. It's actually terribly intimidating. So here I am, suitably intimidated by Ravi's formidable and superior intellect. Well, on that note, Darby, I will give you the first word. Um, just from the president's uh, announcement yesterday evening, the economic relief package that he announced, um, I'm sure those of, those of us in the liberal camp will call it a stimulus package with all of the negative connotations, but I would like to just get your take on what the president announced, broadly speaking. Yes, okay, thank you. Just a few mo uh, minutes, if you don't mind. Uh, if anybody, I've, I've read something on English, just send me an email and I will make sure you get these sort of stuff that I write every now and again. Uh, well, I need to, I wanted to answer this question, is this a good thing or a bad thing that the president has announced? And I can't really answer that, but uh, I'm trying to. So let me just perhaps give a short summary of, or at least the way that I see the announcements of the president. And they touch on a couple of things that are important. First of all, all the health issues, the health situation and what he plans to do uh, in order you know, to contain the virus. So that's a health question. Secondly, uh, you made some announcements regarding the needy and how the needy is going to be supported. And then thirdly, some announcements regarding the South African economy. I'm going to touch on that as well. And then he also, at the end of his speech, in fact, at the beginning of the speech also, uh, gave us a bit of a hint on what how he sees the future. And that is the interesting part. We'll get to that as well. Just a few comments about the health issues. An additional spending, about 20 billion rand uh, on additional health spending. And the money is probably going to be borrowed from some sort of international organization like the International Monetary Fund. A number of measures have been put in place to support the needy, like, for example, an increase in, in the various grants and an extension uh, on... Uh, um, on uh, the, the various grants and not only an increase but he's also going to extend it over a, a period of time and I think this is a very dangerous thing but I'll get to that a little bit later as well. So we're talking about the significant increase in the various grants of around about 50 billion rand and also uh, announcement on a 20 billion rand additional funding for the municipalities uh, for their support effort in alleviating poverty and support for the populace uh, generally speaking. A number of announcements regarding the economy, like, uh, for example, 100 billion rand set aside to create jobs, as we always know, or to protect jobs, 200 billion rand guarantee that will be provided via the banks, uh, obviously to businesses. Um, and then a couple of questions on how all of this will be funded. It will be funded by reprioritizing certain expense items on the budget. We can expect another budget by the Minister of Finance. Of course, some... Uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some of the money will be funded from international sources, but I can guarantee you that there will be a significant increase in taxes over time and, of, of course, a significant increase in the borrowing of the state, which will lead to, well, state debt levels completely ballooning. This, has, this is happening in a situation where the South African economy is actually contracting. And then the president, this is the, the part that's really scary, and that is he referred to economic change in economic strategy, economic reforms, uh, some transformation, words like inclusive growth, that sort of stuff. And that I think we need to spend some time on that. A couple of comments. I think uh, this, this is just some of my comments. I think it's important to understand the context. And the context is, is this is happening in South Africa and we have to understand with that we have a government that is very inefficient. It, uh, it is known to be a government that is quite corrupt. And the reason why the South African economy is where we are today is because of the previous mismanagement of the South African economy. And of course, there's a significant ideological undertone that we have to keep in mind all the time. So I think the president simply did not have much of a choice but to increase, especially some poverty alleviation measures. You, I mean, you can't allow people to die. But the reason why we can't support the economy through the normal measures, that is assuming if you want to, is because we, we can't do that because of previous mismanagement. So I think that is where we are in a way. It's a rock, between a rock and a hard place in a way. Uh, the president in, uh, kept on digging 
we are going to get into very, very deep trouble financially. Uh, the fiscal account simply cannot afford these sort of things. But we've reached a point where the president simply does not have that much of a choice but to do these sort of things. Because clearly, he's not prepared to take the necessary steps in terms of getting rid of South African Airways. In fact, this morning I heard they're going to revise South African Airways again. I cannot understand that. Um, and that sort of stuff. So yes, this is where we are. This is, these are emergency measures uh, 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 mentioned by the president. And we have been caught in a spiral, and this spiral is going to lead to weaker economic growth over time. And I'm afraid eventually what this all is going to lead to is very high levels of inflation and over time. Um, yeah, there are some comments. Uh, Leon uh, also asked me to make one or two comments regarding state debt. State debt levels is likely to exceed 80% of GDP within just over a year or so. Fiscal deficit is likely to run around about 12% to GDP and it will continue for a number of years. And the important thing is once you have announced an increase in state spending, a temporary increase in state spending is never a temporary increase in state spending. And then like what I've said, the really scary part for me, what does this new uh, the, the restructuring, what does it really mean? What, what does the president mean by radical economic transformation? Because I'm afraid what, I, what he means and what I think is needed are probably two different things. Uh, thank you, Davi. Very uh, sobering thoughts and analysis there, I think, for, for us and for the viewers. Leon, is there anything in the, in the president's announcement that you would like to highlight and perhaps lead into some of our discussion on structural reform and what you think sort of structural reform should take for South Africa going forward? Yes, uh, it, the president's announcement has the usual contradiction that we get from government, nothing new, business as usual, namely a statement that we're going to have high growth uh, structural reforms that will put the economy on a growth trajectory, but those structural reforms are never aligned with what, what is associated with high growth and probably causes high growth worldwide. So we know that if we look around the world, it's quite simple. If you have co-market structural reforms, then you have high growth. There are essentially no exceptions to that rule, or to the extent there are exceptions like Israel, for example, they so-called special cases. But of the world's 200 countries, basically if you have pro-market reforms, you have prosperity. Uh, what's more is that if you have prosperity, you have higher life expectancy. In other words, by far the best health measure the government can take is to cause prosperity, to, to increase growth. And the effect, for example, of this lockdown, we don't get now how long it will be, but the five-week lockdown reduces GDP by, you know, you can debate and argue and speculate, but let's say between five and 10%. And that is associated with a lower life expectancy or increased mortality rate that is actually worse than the COVID threat, even if nothing was done. In other words, the, the economic impact on health is worse than COVID would have been if, if nothing was done at all. But it's worse than that because the effect of the, of the lockdown and the measures taken is a complete abandonment of civil liberties, no more freedom of association movement. Essentially, everyone is now under house arrest. Uh, and we call it when you put in prison, you locked up. When you locked in your house, we call it locked down. So the directionality is actually uh, purely cosmetic. So that's the one thing. The other thing is that uh, uh, so it fails on all three counts. It's worse for health and life expectancy and mortality to have the lockdown than to do nothing. It's obviously completely devastating for civil liberty, freedom. It's just completely wiped out, pushed. And elements of it are just completely loony. If I may say, as a lifelong non-smoker myself, and somebody who doesn't like and doesn't approve of smoking, but nonetheless, I approve of freedom. And the government's own position, which I wonder about myself, is that tobacco is an addiction. So what they've done is they've put something like 15 to 20 percent of the population in a so-called addiction. Whether it's an addiction or a habit can be debated, but nonetheless, they've made them all go cold turkey, isolated them denied them access to other people, all the social benefits of interaction. 
So now they're lonely and depressed and isolated and have no freedom and cannot even get their fix, assuming tobacco is a fix. Uh, so th there can be no logic to this. It is, it is completely loony and I am af I'm afraid that what happens when there's a crisis is people in power have an appetite for power, they get intoxicated by power and they're just wielding power as an end in itself with no logic to it. Well, Leon, may I add to that? Yeah, of course. Yes, I just want to say, you know, part of a very important reason why we are where we are today is because of a crisis that was created by government because they've been following the wrong macroeconomic policies and other factors like, like corruption and everything to do with that. So now we have a crisis, which is, and of course I must also add, is that the, the, the corona crisis is a crisis on top of a previous crisis already. And I think it's going to be, it's going to make things much worse, the lockdown or lock, lock up, uh, because it is going to lead to an increase, a significant increase in poverty. Uh, and I've done some calculations says that poverty is probably going to kill more people in South Africa, not necessarily hunger, but poverty is going to kill more people than what the virus would have killed in South Africa anyway. Um, but, but the real irony here for me is that politicians create a crisis like this, and then they, because they are far too involved in economic activities in any event, and when they are getting involved, they, they misuse their power. So they create a crisis like this, things deteriorate, and then you are forced for the politicians to, to step into this mess and to increase the involvement, which will actually, actually make things even worse. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to get to, the president did make some announcements regarding the increases in the various grants. And I must tell you, I agree with that because there are children literally going hungry. But the reason why they're going hungry is because of the previous wrong macroeconomic policies that they've been put in place. So, so, so this is the irony of the whole thing. Create the crisis and use the crisis to create another crisis and to expand your influence on the economy. And, and that's my biggest concern. We've got far more state intervention now. And I'm afraid knowing politicians, knowing bureaucrats, is that once the crisis is over, if it's ever going to be over, I'm not so sure about this. Once the crisis is over, there is no way that those politicians and bureaucrats are going to give back all those extra powers that they've simply um, uh, taken, uh, simply uh, took on themselves in a, in a current crisis. So that is going to be our main threat and our main fight going forward to get politicians um, to give back those powers that they've taken away from us and to mm -hmm. give back the, 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 the freedoms uh, that we need as individuals. So if I can come in here, um, there's a, we need to actually also look at the data on what the risk of COVID really is. And we in the Free Market Foundation have commissioned some interesting analysis where we've asked the statisticians and, and uh, one, another researcher are working together on this and they've caucused also with Davi, discussed it with him and Davi, their work's gone quite a lot further since that discussion. But to, to try and crystallize something out of this, to put it very simply, the worst case scenario based on Italy, which is the worst case. So if you assume we would be as bad as Italy, and we won't, we'll be about a quarter of Italy simply because of our age demographics. Uh, so we would be roughly a quarter of the mortality rate in Italy. The life expectancy is shortened by COVID if nothing is done by about three days. In other words, the South Af average South African will live three days longer if the, uh, crisis, if the lockdown works and if the lockdown doesn't cause any economic harm, which of course it does. Uh, so we will have a loss of life as a result of the uh, lockdown of probably something because of uh, inferior and unimproved health services and access to food and good diet and good housing, for example, housing, waterborne sewage, etc., services of people now living in shanty towns and, and squatter camps. Uh, because of that, we will probably have about 30,000 deaths due to poverty. Uh, then, uh, of course, the psychological, emotional, civil liberties impacts are there. The maximum deaths, the highest risk of likelihood if uh, are, are based on the Italian data, which is the world's worst, based on the world's average data, it's not nearly this bad, is something like twelve to 15,000 premature deaths. Now, we need to understand that. A life is never saved or lost. A life is extended or shortened. 
And what we are having now is that there's a shortening of life expectancy for people who have very little anyway. For example, a 95-year, 96-year-old man died with COVID, and then they say he was killed by COVID, not age, not any of the other conditions that he had. A TB kills annually in South Africa, according to the World Health Organization, 63,000 people. So if you want to save lives in South Africa, you attack other things than COVID, and you attack them in ways of improving quality of life, something like the Swedes. Uh, you have a voluntary social distancing, or what I call antisocial distancing. I don't know why we call distancing social. It should be it's antisocial. So we have this antisocial distancing. By all means, the police and the army can go around handing out gloves and disinfectant and masks and explaining to people about social distancing and risk. People can be encouraged to do it at home by radio and TV. They can be taught how to do it if they go back to school, for example. That is where you can learn about it. If you go back to the workplace, you can practice and teach social distancing there to keep people away from where they would be explained and where they would practice antisocial distancing is completely the wrong thing to do. What you're doing is you're forcing people into very poor people, this is, into very close proximity. You're forcing them into conditions where in any event they have contagious TB and will now have more, and they will now have a more, a higher risk of getting COVID. And, uh, but because fortunately for us, we have a low population average in South Africa, 27 years. Italy, for example, is 45. We have about, because of that age demographic, about a quarter of their risk. In other words, we are a quarter of the, the worst for us is a quarter of the world's risk. In other words, it's more likely to be like an eighth or so of the world average. So what we have here is a, we must decolonize South Africa. We're importing the World Health Organization's first world bourgeois to a bourgeois-defined problem and a problem that in South Africa affects mainly, at least for now, the bourgeoisie. We all fear that it might run right from the shantytown, uh, but whether that will be so serious is unclear because of the low age and uh, the, the effect of COVID, the effect of flu, the effect of pneumonia, of TB, is much, much higher on older people. So it's older people who might not have had much life expectancy anyway who have less and that's the worst case scenario. So it's long what the health gain might be by the lockdown. It's less obvious, it's less direct, it's less sexy for politicians, and as Darby says, it doesn't give them excuses to go on a on a power binge, on a on a on a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The megalomaniacal uh, fever which they're suffering from instead of they, they, they must also decolonize us and stop having an assumption of bourgeois solutions, lockdown in middle class and upper class houses, lockdown for people in shanty towns, in highly dense living conditions, in apartment blocks in Hillbrow and Berea, in, in, and in, in rural villages where there is no attempt at enforcement whatsoever. Right here where I am in a small village door, you see a bucky loaded with people or a taxi loaded with people literally pass in front of my house, a police van, and they wave and smile and whoop at each other. So uh, it is, it is fortunately, fortunately, because the lockdown here would be entirely and completely counterproductive. Thank you, Leon. Darvi, I wanted to ask you, maybe just looking forward a bit, so I mean, just my personal de definition of radical economic tra transformation, I don't consider that to be big government spending, government controls, um, government controlling every aspect of people's lives. I consider radical economic transformation, at least meaningful radical economic transformation, economic freedom, uh, giving people agency, allowing them to create wealth for themselves and for their families, having choices in terms of employment and negotiating contracts, that sort of thing. So in terms of low hanging fruit, what the government can do going forward, um, what do you think, you know, would be the best sort of things for them to identify and work on? Um, I, and again, you don't have to be very realistic here because we know that government might very much not look at these sorts of things, but what do you think 
you know, could be the best yeah. that they could do sort of first of all? Yeah, well, I'm afraid uh, I, I'm, I can give you a long list of things that, uh, that, can, that can be done to, to get this economy growing again and actually over time reduce unemployment, poverty and all those sort of things. But, uh, but you know, it's not, not going to happen and it's not going to happen. Uh, and I guess uh, the mistake that I made and I think many other analysts made was that we looked at government through a, a certain ideological lens. And because mm. we know of the influence of the Communist Party and the ANC being a socialist institution, we, we, people make the mistake in thinking that they are going with socialist kind of policies. That's not the reason why they're implementing these interventionist kind of policies. They do that because the ANC is not an ideologically driven organization anymore. The ANC simply lives off the state. It is really as simple as that. It's not an ideological organization anymore. It simply lives off the state. And if you understand that, you will understand that it's become basically impossible for anybody like, for instance, the Manus to cut back on state spending, which needs to happen, because that will undermine the existence of the INC, because they live off the state. So I just wanted to make that comment. Okay, so what can be done and what should be done? Um, I think the first step that we need to take certainly is to get this economy out of lockdown, and that is to get this economy to grow. Uh, hopefully there will be some announcements on this. Uh, I appreciate that we were all, all unsure, um, weeks all go on what should be done. Uh, we were in a learning process. Uh, we didn't know how severe this, this virus is going to be. We, uh, economists didn't, didn't even understand what the impact is going to be on the, on the economies. But we've learned a lot subsequently. So clearly the first thing that must happen is to remove this economy to get this economy to grow. Once we've got this economy to grow, and I think actually we've got the wonderful opportunities now. One example of an opportunity is because we ran out of money, uh, we can now really get rid of institutions or organizations or give them a name of parasitals, like for example South African Airways. So this is an opportunity because I mean if you spend more money on South African Airways in this kind of environment. It must be madness. It, it's always been madness, but it must be madness in, on steroids if you keep on spending money on South African Airways and people are literally are going hunger, hungry. So this is the opportunity to do those sort of things. And guess what? This morning I read in the newspapers that, uh, that Pravin Gordon actually is planning to revive South African Airways. I, I, I mean, the mind boggles. I can't get around that. So, but, but the opportunity certainly is there to start fixing those sort of things. Like for example, ESCOM. ESCOM, what we can do, we can use this opportunity to restructure ESCOM, which must include opening up the power, power generation and the distribution part of electricity to the private sector. Now is the time to do that, and we can do that. Now is also the time to cut back on state spending on a bunch of all sorts of silly and stupid things. Uh, let me give you one example. The Minister of Sport, that's a bit of a bugbear to me. The Minister of Sport, I never understand what the job of the Minister of Sport is. Does he watch TV the whole day? Does he go and watch rugby games? What's the job of the Minister of Finance under normal circumstances? Now we've got, the, now we've got a lockdown. Nobody's allowed to walk his dog outside, let alone play a game of soccer, for instance. So it, I can't see why we should have a Minister of Sport. Close that down. Use, and this, the, the excuse is, it's so easy politically uh, to, to come with an excuse, but we can use the money better for other things that are far more pressing and far more important. That's the kind of things that we need to do now. Of course, uh, Leon and, um, will give you a long list of other things that need to be done as well. We have to protect private property rights. Now's the opportunity to say, listen, we simply cannot afford BEE anymore. It's far more important to get this economy growing than to chase some political or social uh, agendas now. We can't do that. Get rid of BE under these sort of circumstances. Um, and now is the opportunity perhaps to instead of talking about stealing people's property, now is the opportunity to, to actually to privatize and to give away all the savings that are available to be given away to the, to, to the poor, if need be. So make use of this crisis to establish a basis for stronger economic growth going forward. But again, now we can talk about that. We know what needs to happen. But the problem is the ANC lives off the state. And as long as the ANC lives off the state, these sort of things, these sort of announcements, and this, 
this crossing this Rubicon is simply not the right way. Chris, uh, if I can come in there, you want no, us to do. get the structural reform, so let me um, speak to that. Are you, are you hearing me? Okay. Um, the, the, the Davi sort of introduced some of it. He mentioned, for example, fixing Eskom and electricity. Let me just say that is the big elephant in the room. By, in the room. It's by far the biggest issue in South Africa. Uh, one of the tightest correlations you ever get in social science or economics in the world is the correlation between energy consumption, not energy capacity, and energy uh, and, and growth and, and GDP per capita. It is pretty much in, in lockstep, it's ratcheted, and the two move together. As does health, by the way. The health, uh, uh, GDP, and energy uh, are the tightest correlation you'll find probably on any graph. Anyone could look them up, of course, on the internet with great ease. So yes, we've got to get ESKIM right, and the way to do that is very simple. Change one word in the Energy Act, and that's the word, the change the word no to the word any. Uh, it says at the moment, it's very simple, two letters actually. Uh, it says no person may generate, produce, distribute, transmit energy or trade energy in South Africa without a license from NERSA, the National Energy Regulation, the regulator, who has simply historically refused to give anyone else a license except through a single buyer, Eskom, for example, um, the uh, renewable energy, wind and solar suppliers. And uh, what you do is you change no person may to any person may generate, supply, trade, sell electricity, including a company that has a generator in its basement can sell electricity to the building next to it, for example, or a farmer can sell to the neighboring farmer. There are already perfectly adequate off-grid power lines, and I won't go into the technicalities of the difference between transmission and grid. Uh, then Darby is absolutely right again, if I can reinforce, the very stupidest thing to do is to talk about the state becoming a property thief and taking property without compensation. Um, what you do now is you quite the opposite. You say, please come to South Africa. There's no place in the world where your property is safer than here. There's no place in the world where energy is more competitively supplied than here. This is the world's investment haven. And uh, if I can go through a few others that you must do, one is get rid of forex control. This is now an exception. Very few countries in the world have it. This is a, literally an old Nazi idea, came up under the Nazi regime in Germany, imported to South Africa as a strategic measure to perpetuate apartheid. And we live with it now, a generation after apartheid supposedly ended. And most of the world, including our immediate African neighbors, no longer have exchange controls and we must get rid of it. It's a stupid idea because basically what it says, we don't trust and attach value to our own currency. Uh, then if I can mention a few other big ones, year after year after year, starting with Mandela, every state of the nation address says that we are going to reduce red tech and we're going to free up the economy, especially small business. While they are reading the state of the nation address in parliament, there's a whole slew of bills that do precisely the opposite. Absolutely none of it has been done. I don't want to be unfair to Mandela. Under him, there was actually a lot of liberalization and privatization, and he moved the economy in the right direction. Another big elephant in the room is Spluma. That's the town planning and township and housing development law of South Africa, which basically, and I can go into lots of detail, it's an area of my expertise, but to cut to the chase here, now basically what it says is that people may not improve the quality of their own housing unless they can develop a first world and proclaim a first world township under sophisticated bourgeois town planning laws, township development schemes, township registers, land survey, property developers and so on are required. That means that somebody is forced to live in a tin shack or forced to live in an overcrowded Alex or forced to live in an overcrowded block of flats uh, and are may not by law, they are forbidden by law to improve their own quality of housing, which they're perfectly willing and capable to and capable of doing. And then if I can mention the small business issue. Small business is supposedly sexy. Uh, Ramaphosa talks about it. He says that he's in favor of it, but he in turn presides over a government that absolutely smothers it, squashes it, 
basically declares it effectively illegal. It's probably close to legally impossible to operate a small or informal, well, informal means illegal. It's a synonym for illegal or a synonym for criminalized. The informal sector is the criminalized sector. Now, it's probably actually illegal to run a small, it's impossible to run a small business legally because of all the laws. So what you do is we have a simple proposal, which is you have a small business impact assessment. Every single law that is passed and every policy that's adopted must pass a small business impact assessment uh, uh, test. Uh, and we already have a socio-economic impact assessment. It can simply be extended by adding a small business impact assessment component. And that should be also a basis to challenge a law. In other words, you should be able to go to court when small businesses are under attack and say this via this law has not been supported by a small business impact assessment that will liberate the entire small business sector of south africa as for the anc supporting uh, being supported by the state yes they are i have a simple proposal to that which you should say to everybody who's now leeching off the state you can continue doing so on condition that you stop doing your job on condition that you have for the rest of your life a holiday so that all these bureaucrats and officials who reach off the state mm -hmm. sit by the, uh, by the sea and look into the uh, into the blue yonder and stop uh, punishing us twice over. They punish us by taking the money and then they punish us by stifling us. At least do only the first part and leave us alone after that, leave society alone. And then uh, I want to finally add the biggest thing of all is the financial uh, sector regulation to which Darby himself is subjected and whether he can comply with it would be an interesting question. As a lawyer, I'm willing to have a wager with him that I could walk into his business and find that he's on a daily basis violating some of these truly idiotic laws. He cannot possibly monitor the directives that come on a daily basis out of the, uh, the market conduct authority and uh, it would be more than a full-time job for him. So he is an habitual criminal. Darby sitting right there is an habitual <laughs> criminal because he is not complying with these idiotic financial laws. And we have this gigantic empire, the Market Conduct Authority. Now, the problem with it is that it, regu it thinks it regulates insurance companies and banks and medical aids. Uh, that they can do. They're big and ugly enough to look after themselves. The real problem is the impact on small business and informal sector lending. And I want to give an, a practical example, and I hope she doesn't mind me mentioning her. The former mm -hmm. first lady, Zanele Mbeki, came to the Free Market Foundation and said, they are making loans to rural mm -hmm. women in rural informal enterprises. And she said, they cannot operate lawfully. It is not possible to operate lawfully. They cannot comply with the National Credit Act, with the Market Conduct Authority, with the Banking Act. To do what they do, which is to micro loans and small business finance, they would have to be a registered bank, a registered financial service provider, registered financial intermediary. They would have to have every loan for a few thousand rand in writing with people who may be illiterate. And that has to be lodged with a registrar of all loans, the, the National Credit Register. Uh, so we have laws that actually simply, thank goodness, are ignored the town planning laws, the zoning laws, the financial laws. But the trouble is that anyone trying to operate lawfully in these sectors can't do so. So here is the simple list. The state gets rid of the big errors, the big mistakes, the things that are killing the economy, uh, the lack of a competitive energy sector, uh, the over-regulation of the financial sector, the over-regulation and smothering and stifling of small business, uh, the uh, it must just abolish and go back to what used to be called before we had town planning law. The law was in a conveyance of registering townships. We, it was done by what was called neighborhood law, common law. Perfectly adequately done, need all these town planning laws and zoning laws. Just repeal them or at least relax them because they'll never be so sensible as to do sensible things. So let's hope they do half sensible things. Uh, so. The, 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 and then to, to, to wrap up, it's very simple. We produce in the FMF the International Economic Freedom of the World Index, along with about other inst 80 other institutes in the world. It is very simple. 
if you want to prosper and you want to be rich and you want to have a high life expectancy and you want people not to be dying of, of COVID or flu or TB or anything else, you become rich. How do you become rich? You have a high score on the Economic Freedom of the World Index. We were going up. We went up from about 120th in the world to about 40th. And then during the um, Zuma era and the Mbeki era, we plateaued off and started tumbling down and we're down now to something like 140th, which means we will be poor. If you don't go up the index, you will be poor. That is, it's that simple. It's, it's not rocket science, it's straightforward. You get the index, you tick the boxes, get the things in the index, to each item to give you a high score, then the country will prosper and we will have good health. We will have a high life expectancy. It really is that simple. It's not simplistic, it is simple. Thank you, Leon. I think as you've very clearly and, and beautifully illustrated, there are definitely steps that can be taken if only, you know, the people in, in the corridors of power would listen. And something I'd like to highlight with any regulations and red tape, as has always been the case in South Africa throughout its history, with a more regulation and red tape there is, the worse the effect is on the majority of South Africans, i.e. poor black South Africans. It makes it much more difficult for them to prosper, to improve their lives, and to make any sort of uh, proper living in, in, in the current world. Davi, I'll give you the parting shot, the, the parting thought, if you'd like to, to leave the viewers with something to ponder. Seeing as we're all under house arrest, uh, we have a lot more time to think about some things in thought. I mean, myself as a philosopher, I enjoy that, but I know some people are experiencing existential crises, but something you would like for them to sort of chew on and think about? Yeah, um, and as always, I try to find a silver lining somewhere. Yeah? I'm battling, but here are a couple of things that I think are, are important. Just Honestly, give us a silver sliver. It doesn't have to be a silver lining. <laughs> Let me see if I can, can identify one or two. Maybe some advice. Um, and that is that I, what I advise people to do is to understand and to realize that we are in very deep trouble here. And people think I'm just always seeing the dark side of life. That certainly is not the case. But I think we have to be realistic and we have to be well informed. So my advice to people is make sure that you are well informed about what is going on in the country and what is going on in the economy. You must be well informed because if you're well informed, you will be able to do the second thing. And that is to identify those risks, risks that are typical in whatever industry that you are operating in. So that, that's the second step. Be well informed and identify the risks that are uh, applicable in whatever you do. The third thing that you need to do, once you've identified those risks, you have to manage those risks. Uh, and a simple example is, is uh, for instance, is that you have to have managing risks means that you have to have a proper budget, as an example. Managing risks means that you have to make sure that your cash flow remains healthy and at least positive under these sort of difficult circumstances. It is also important uh, to, 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 to uh, your responsibility is primarily to yourself and to your family or whoever you want to consider as your, as your people. So be responsible for yourself, be res make sure that what, uh, if you run a business, that your business can survive financially and that your business, business can, can prosper in future. But that is your primarily or your primary uh, responsibility and that's a responsibility uh, to yourself. And then maybe the best silver lining or sliver is that we have a hugely um, destructive government. They have done immense damage to the South African economy. They are very inefficient in what they do. They're going to do more stuff in future. But because they're so highly inefficient, they, they also cannot implement bad ideas. And that's the good thing of having an incompetent government. They cannot implement bad ideas either. And what we're probably going to see in future is the weaker state. Not because they want to, because, but it's simply because it's not well managed. So we're going to see a weaker state. And in a very weird kind of way, it is quite possible that in future, we will have less state intervention, simply because, because the state is collapsing all around us. And see that as an opportunity and see that in a way as a good thing, because rational people do not want the big state, we want the smaller state. And we've, what we are currently seeing around us is that the state is in fact losing much of its power, simply 
because it is so badly managed. And that is where the opportunities are. So in a way, perhaps with a bit of luck in future, we will be living in a state-free society or much more state-free society than what we're living in at the moment. Thank you very much, Davi. Uh, viewers, I'll end on that uh, silver lining there. Um, I would like to remind you all to please go to our website, www.freemarketfoundation.com. There you can find all of the articles, the media releases, everything we've been doing, the reports as well on the lockdown and the effects, the economic effects thereof, especially on the poorer people in South Africa. Please share our articles and media releases. Please remember to like this video. Please share it on all your different social media platforms. We greatly appreciate your support. It means a lot to us, especially in these difficult times. Uh, please stay safe and we will talk to you again very soon. For now, bye.